the proto-Semitic genome, haplogroup E versus J. But before we get too deep into the video, first I want to tell you guys about my social media platforms. So I have a Clubhouse account, and we can actually talk to one another on it. I also host Clubhouse Rooms every now and then, where I might talk about history and genetics of the Middle East and Africa. I have a Twitter page, a Facebook account, and a Facebook page, as well as a Instagram, all titled The Hebrew of Israel. And what I typically do on these platforms is post upcoming videos, as well as um, slides for my presentations. And so just be on the lookout for all of that on my social media platforms. And if you want to support me financially for the channel, you can look at my Patreon as well as my PayPal and my GoFundMe. And with all of that out of the way, let's begin with the video. Now let's cover the best likely location for proto-Semites and the best likely genome of proto-Semites to determine which haplogroup has the best chance of being the Y chromosome of early Semitic population, haplogroup E or haplogroup J. One of the best origins for proto-Semites, specifically from an older perspective, is the North African origin of Semites. Linguistics have, or linguists, have said for years that Semites came from North Africa. This is from Semitic Languages Outline of a Comparative Grammar by E. Lipsky, and it says, this implies that the speakers of Proto-Semitic were dwelling, were still dwelling in Africa in the 5th millennium BC in the Neolithic subplume, circa 5,500 through 3,500 BC, when the Sahara's climate was much wetter so that erosion took place, as in other moist, temperate, or subtropical regions, and, the, and there was a proper system of rivers and vegetation consisting of grass with trees. A worsening of environmental conditions is indicated in North Africa, circa 3500 BC, with disappearance of vegetation and major faunal break, desert, uh, desertification and desertion. This might have been the period when the speakers of Proto-Semitic passed through the Nile Delta from the west to the east and reached Western Asia, where written documents of the 3rd millennium BC preserve noticeable traces of pre-Semitic and in Mesopotamia also of pre-Sumerian substream. Thus, from North Africa, wave after wave of Semitic migrations would seem to have set forth the earliest of these migrants and those who went furthest to the east were the Akkadians who journeyed along the Fertile Crescent through the through Palestine and Syria, and crossing over into Mesopotamia, reached northern Babylon, circa 3000 BC, and founded the first Semitic Empire at Kish. But it's not just old books and papers or outdated information that says this, even the latest papers on the origins of proto-Semites states that Semites came from Africa. The Bayesian phylogenetic analysis of Semitic languages identifies an early Bronze Age origin of Semitic in the Near East covers this. And it says, our analysis of the Semitic language family produced a, a data phylogeny that estimates the origin of Semitic at approximately 4,400 through 7,400 YBP this results indicate that the ancestor of all Semitic languages in our data set was being spoken in the Near East no earlier than approximately 7,400 YBP after having diverged from Afroasiatic in Africa. The discovery of such early Semitic languages could increase estimates of the age of Semitic and alter its geographical origin if these early Semitic languages were found in Africa rather than the Middle East. Also, uh, the map also presents the the dispersal of Semitic languages inferred from our study, an origin of Afroasiatic along the African coast of the Red Sea, supported by com comparative analysis, is indicated in red. Although 
Although other African origins of Afroasiatic have been proposed, such as Southwest Ethiopia, the assumed location of the divergence of ancestral Semitic from Afroasiatic between the African coast of the Red Sea and the Near East is indicated in italics. We used Bayesian phylogenetic methods to elucidate the relationships and divergence dates of Semitic languages, which we then related to epigraphic and archaeological records to produce a com comprehensive hypothesis of Semitic origins and dispersals after the divergence of ancestral Semitic from Afroasiatic in Africa. We estimate that Semitic had an early Bronze Age origin in the Levant, followed by an expansion of Akkadian into Mesopotamia. So, if Semites came from North Africa, then they would have carried haplogrubi. This is from the phylogeography of Y chromosome binary haplotypes and the origins of modern human populations, and it says, the expansion of Neolithic farmers from the Middle East into Europe is also represented in the NRY data, although suggesting a relatively localized area of impact, as mentioned before, in relation to African NRY history, a Mesolithic population carrying Group 3 lineages with the M35 slash M215 mutation expanded northwards from Sub-Saharan Africa to North Africa and the Levant. The Levantine population of farmers that dispersed into Europe during and after the Neolithic carried these African Group 3 M35 slash M215 lineages. We suggest that a population with this subclade of the African Yap M145, M203, and PN2 cluster expanded into the southern and eastern Mediterranean at the end of the Pleistocene. These lineages would have been introduced then from the Middle East into southern Europe and to a lesser extent northern India and Pakistan by farmers during the Neolithic expansion. If Semites came from ancient North African populations of the Heliocene, then they would have had Ibero-Marusian ancestry. This Ibero-Marusian DNA would have been carried by Proto-Semites into the Middle East. Furthermore, Ibero-Marusians also had haplogroup B. This is from Paleolithic DNA from the Caucasus Revealed Core of West Eurasian Ancestry, and it says, our code modeling of Epileopaleolithic Natufians and Ibero-Marusians from Tefralt confirms that the Tefralt population was mixed. But instead of specifying gene flow from the ancestors of Natufians into the ancestors of Tefralt as originally reported, we infer gene flow in the reverse direction into Natufians. The Neolithic population from Morocco, closely related to Tefalt, is also consistent with being descendant from the source of this gene flow and appears to have no admixture from the Levantine Neolithic. If our model is correct, Paleolithic Natufians trace part of their ancestry to North Africa, consistent with morphological and archaeological studies that indicate a spread of morpho morphological features and, artef and artifacts from North Africa into the Near East. Such a scenario would also explain the presence of Y chromosome haplogroup E in the Natufians and Levantine farmers, a common link between the Levant and Africa. So basically, an Ibero-Marusian source came into uh, the Levant and you know mixed with the Natufians, which is why the Natufians have some Ibero-Marusian ancestry, rather than Natufians going into North Africa. And all this connects with you know Semites coming out of North Africa, going into the Levant, or the ancestors of Semites going out, coming out of North Africa, going into the Levant. And we can actually go a little bit further when it comes to haplogroup E as well. Plas Plesiocene North African genes link Near East and Sub-Saharan African human populations. We analyzed the genetic affinities of the Tefalt individuals by performing uh, principal uh, component analysis, PCA, 
and model based clustering of worldwide data when projecting onto the top PCs of African and West Asian and West Eurasian uh, populations. The Turfer all individuals form a distinct cluster in an intermediate position between present day North Africans and East Africans. Consistently, we find that all males with sufficient nuclear DNA preservation carry Y haplogroup E1B1B1B1A1. The closely related E1B1B1B haplogroup has been reported for Epiopaleolithic Natufians and pre pottery Neolithic Levantines. Unsupervised genetic clustering also suggests a connection of Tupper Alt to the Near East. The three major components that comprise of Tupper Alt genes are maximized in early, hel in early Heliocene Natufians, East African hunter gatherer Hazak from North Central Tanzania, and West Africans. We calculated outgroup statistics of the form uh, of the form across worldwide ancient and present day test populations. Consistent with previous analysis, we find that ancient Near Eastern populations, especially Epiopaleolithic Natufians and early Neolithic Levantines, show the highest outgroup values with Turfa alt. And so this is from Projecting Ancient Ancestry in Modern Day Arabians and Iranians, a key role of the past exposed Arabo Persian Gulf on human migrations. And it says also the ancient Ibero Marusian specimens could be in part descendants of basal Eurasians, as they have a shared genetic affinity with early Heliocene Near Easterners, best proxy are the Natufians and one third of input from Sub-Saharan Africans, a mixture between West and East Africans. Thus so far, Southwest Asia is still the best possible home, probable homeland for the hypothetical basal Eurasian population. Modern day Saudi Arabian and Yemeni uh, samples cluster tightly with the, lower with the lower left quadrant overlapping with the three Natufian sa uh, samples and were and were close to the Levant PPND pre pottery Neolithic B and PPNC pre pottery Neolithic C, the Levant and Levant Bronze Age samples. A part of the modern United Arab Emirates, UAE, and Oman samples were more dispersed and mingled with North African Ibero Marusian and North African Early Neolithic in accordance to some Sub Saharan input in their genomes. And this is from how Eurasia was born. It says the most simple solution for the discrepancy between genetic high genetic diversity in the Levant and high and high linguistic diversity in Africa could be that Semitic is a result of a relatively late remigration from North Africa or the ancient Canaan after ancestors of the other branches of Afro-Asiatic migrated to North Africa. And this is from Genetics, Egypt and History, Interpreting Geographical Patterns of Y Chromosome Variation. It says, it can be postulated that select M35 carriers, speakers from Africa of a stage of ancestral Semitic, pre-proto-Semitic, entered the Near East. So you can see as everything's come together, these E markers speaking ancestral Semitic coming out of Africa and to the Near East, bringing this Ibero-Marusian DNA and passing along this Natufian DNA. And this is from In Hot Pursuit of Language and Prehistory. The overall pattern is consistent with a model of the first speakers of Afroasiatic having emerged in or near the Horn of Africa or the Nile Valley. The presence of Semitic in the Near East might be explained as follows. Early pre-proto-Semitic speakers would have migrated into Syrial Palestine before the Neolithic being taken by their M35 bearers, specifically M35 slash M78, and adopted by populations bearing M8, M89 lineages. And this is from Peter Solomons, and it says, in this group, we many of us conclude that haplogroup E is one of the major founding haplogroups of Semitic people and that haplogroup E people were the ones that brought proto-Semitic language out of the Afroasiatic homeland in Northeast Africa and into the, and into the Levant and Mesopotamia. 
So, quite literally, Semites could have, have could be considered African. And it's not just me saying this, but it's actually researchers in the field. This is from Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond. And it says, Greenberg determined that Semitic languages really form only one of six or more branches of a much larger language family, Afroasiatic. Even the Semitic subfamily itself is mainly African, 12 of its 19 surviving, surviving languages being confined to Ethiopia. This suggests that Afroasiatic languages arose in Africa and that only one branch of them spread to the Near East. Hence, it may have been Africa that gave birth to the languages spoken by the authors of the Old and New Testaments and the Quran, the moral pillars of Western civilization. And this is from a conversation with Christopher Eret, and he says, After all, the early Semites were just a few Africans arriving to find a lot of other people already in the area. So, basically, Semites would have been like an African population coming out of North Africa into the Middle East, carrying haplogroup E and ancestral Semitic languages, and they would have genetically been a mixture of a North African and Levantine group. Now, the second best location for the origin of Semites in the, uh, is the Levant with the Natufians. You can use this model for a young Earth and, you know, even an old Earth uh, perspective. From a young earth perspective, I believe Shem and Eber settled the Levant, by the way. Uh, I have a list of videos that you can check out. This video in particular is one you should check out. Shem and Eber in the future of the promised land because I lay out all the reasons why Shem and Eber likely lived in the Levant. And Shem and Eber would basically have been the ancestors. Well, not the ancestors. Well, yes, the ancestors of, of the two people. But now I'm going to speak from both a old earth and a younger creation perspective when it comes to this uh, Natufian origin. So Semites would descend from Natufians in the Levant, and Natufians carried haplogroup E. And autosomally, Natufians are Asiatic and African, but um, many indigenous Middle Easterners have high amounts of Natufian ancestry. So this is from In Hot Pursuit of Language and Prehistory, and it says, This paper makes an additional inference, since there is archaeological and physical anthropological reason, to believe that the Natufians were related to modern Semitic-speaking peoples of the Levant. Such a scenario would also explain the presence of Y-chromosome haplogroup E in the Natufians and Levantine farmers, a common link between the Levant and Africa. And that was from Paleolithic DNA from the Caucasus Revealed Core of Western Asian Ancestry. And Natuf the Natufian sample consists of 61.2% Arabian, Asiatic, 21.2% uh, 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 North, North African, 10.9% uh, 10 West Asian, and 6.8% Omotic. So, you know, Natufians are basically a split between African and uh, Asiatic. This is from the genomic history of the Middle East, and it says, Arabians and Bedouins are positioned close to ancient Levantines. When we substitute Neolithic, uh, Levant Neolithic with Natufians as source of ancestry in the Middle East, we found that Arabians could be successfully modeled. And this is from Projecting Ancient Ancestry in Modern-Day Arabians and Iranians, a key role of the past, explodes Arabo-Persian Gulf on human populations. And it says, Modern Saudi Arabian and Yemeni samples cluster tightly with the lower left quadrant, overlapping with the three Natufian samples, and were close to the Levant's PPMB and PPNC and the Levant's Bronze Age samples. And so here's a map of the distribution of Natufian uh, ancestry. And as you can see, the, the highest concentration of Natufian ancestry is in the Middle East because they are an ancient Middle Eastern population. And then it expands from the Middle East into places like uh, the Mediterranean, Africa, and other parts of the far Near East. So that's just a good distribution of that. So these proto-Semites 
with Natufian ancestry would have expanded from the Levant into Mesopotamia and, uh, and across the Middle East. And this is from capital group UMBUMB, YDNA, from EUpedia, and it says E-M34 is the main Middle Eastern variety of UMBUMB and is thought to have arrived with proto-Semitic people in the late copper to early Bronze Age. We estimate that Semitic had an early Bronze Age origin in the Levant, followed by an expansion of Akkadian into Mesopotamia. The most plausible candidates for Semitic remigration to the Fertile Crescent with TMRCAs fitting the arrival of the Akkadians and other early Semitic peoples are certain subclades of both E-V22 and E-V12 with relatively early TMRCAs present in the Middle East could be candidates for such remigration such as E-FGC14382, TMRCA is 2200 BCE, and E-V2, E-V3262, TMRCA is 2600 BCE. And here's the high concentration of ancient E samples were found in the Levant and the Middle East, and it overlaps with the area of Natufian culture because, well, it's the Natufians with these E markers and their descendants. And they would have migrated from the Levant into Mesopotamia, just as the paper said, when Semites, early Akkadians, and other early Semitic populations migrated from the Levant into Mesopotamia. It all fits logically and perfectly. And we can see them also dispersing throughout other parts of the Near East, going into Arabia, going into the Horn of Africa, North Africa. So if you look at a map detailing the distribution of Afro-Asiatic languages, capital group E, and Natufian ancestry, everything overlaps with one another and, and it overlaps with one another perfectly. The Natufian origins is by far one of the best candidates for the origins of proto-Semites. So again, here is the area of Natufian culture, but here is the distribution of haplogroup E. Here is the distribution of Afroasiatic and Semitic, and here is the distribution of Natufian ancestry. And as you can see, all of it overlaps, and I don't think that is a coincidence. It is likely that haplogroup B e is Semitic, it is Afroasiatic, and Natufians is what the autosomal DNA would be of a Proto Semite. And of course, when it comes to Abraham, his ancestors lived in that typical area of the Natufian culture. His ancestors coming from Ur of Kashtim, which was built by Natufians, by the way. I cover that in other videos. And, you know, going into the land of Canaan. So, ba basically, the two best origins of Semites is one, the Natufians, the, whether you want to use an old earth or a young earth perspective for it, or you have the North African origin of Semites, and for that it's, it's pretty much strictly Old Earth, but basically um, Semites came from North Africa, and if Semites came from North Africa, they would literally be Africans, and if Semites came from Natufians, then they would have African ancestry. Either way, early Semites did have some type of African or Hermetic influences in their genome. We can see this even in the Book of Jubilees when it comes to Eber and Azurad. And check out my video uh, detailing that subject. Eber and Azurad, who are the descendants of Kush, detailing the, the fact that early Semitic people mixed with Hermetic people, which is why it's log logically it would make sense for Semites to have some type of African DNA whether it's an older or younger. So, but um, basically to sum up Eber, to sum everything up from that video, Eber married Azurad, who is the daughter of Nimrod, and Nimrod is the son of Cush, and Cush is the son of Ham. Uh, Book of Jubilees, chapter 8, verse 9 through 10, says Eber, and he took unto himself, a, unto himself a wife, and her name was Azurad, the daughter of Nimrod. She bare to him a son, and called his name Peleg. The Book of Jubilees mentions the name Nimrod, the Greek form of Nimrod, only as being the father of Azurad, the wife of Eber, and the mother of Peleg. This account would thus make Nimrod an ancestor of Abraham 
and hence all Hebrews. In Genesis chapter 10 verse 8 says, Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth. And so basically, in the lineage of the Hebrews, you would have African, ancient African ancestry. Because Eber is, in a sense, the first Hebrew, his name is Hebrew, crossover, and his wife was a Zurad, a Hamitic Cushite, African basically. So there's definitely an African component within the early Hebrew uh, people. Uh, so basically, descendants of Shem were mixing with Hamites early in their genesis, even before the birth of Abraham. Remember, Eber is long before Abraham. So even before Abraham, you had this Hamitic Semitic union. And the union of Eber and Azurat fits well with the Natufians' genetic makeup being both Asiatic and African. And the main point to take away is that the early Semitic population from an old earth or either a from an old earth is either you know they're African or the early Semitic uh, population from a young earth is that they're heavily admixed with him with Hamites ultimately you know they are genetically African in a sense they will seem to be genetically African with that being said we essentially have two Middle Eastern types Two types of people reside in the Middle East, and you can tell by looking at their genome, even if they both speak the same Semitic language. We looked at how through haplogroups we can tell that there are two different types of people in the Middle East. One haplogroup that originated the Semitic language, i.e. haplogroup E, and the other that isn't Semitic in origin, which is i.e. haplogroup J. Now let's look at autosomal DNA that shows clearly two different people that live in the Middle East, one that is Semitic in origin and the other Indo-European in origin. So basically the two Middle Eastern types are the Natufian Afrasan Semites and the Indo-European Iranians. This is from the genetic, uh, the genomic history of the Middle East and it says, Arabians and Bedouins are positioned close to ancient Levantines. Keyword is in blue. While present day Levantines are drawn towards Bronze Age Europeans, Iraqi Arabs, Iraqi Kurds, and Assyrians appear relatively closer to ancient Iranians. Very interesting. When we substitute Levant Neolithic with Natufians as source of ancestry in the Middle East, we found that Arabians could be successfully modeled. Whereas none, whereas none of the present day Levantines could be, could be modeled, could be modeled as such. So none of the present day Levantines match with the Neolithic Levant, the Neolithic Levantines like the Arabians do. Modeled a uh, model based clustering also show that Arabian populations have subsequently lower uh, Anatolian Neolithic ancestry compared to modern day Levantines. So basically, modern day Levantines are closer to Anatolian populations, specifically Neolithic Anatolians, whereas Arabians do not have, they have very low or non existent Anatolian DNA or Anatolian Neolithic DNA. Very interesting. We found an ancestry related to ancient Iranians that is ubiquitous today in all present in all Middle Easterners. Previous studies showed that this ancestry was not present in the Levant during the Neolithic period, but appeared in the Bronze Age, where fifty percent of the local ancestry was replaced. It was replaced by a population carrying ancient Iranian related ancestry. Very interesting. This population potentially introduced the Y chromosome haplogroup J into the region. Hmm. The haplogroup common in the Tufians, E1B1B, is also frequent in our data set with most lineages coinciding around 8.3 through 7 through 9.7 KYA, basically, you know, 
8,000 to 9,000 or 7,000 years ago. By modeling contemporary populations using ancient genomes, we inferred differences between the Levant and Arabia. The Levant today has higher European slash Anatolian related ancestry. So, you know, modern day Levantines are closer to Europeans and Anatolians, while Arabia has higher African and Natufian like ancestries. Very interesting. It has been suggested that population discontinuity occurred between the late Pleistocene and early Heliocene in Arabia, and that the peninsula was repopulated by Neolithic farmers from the Fertile Crescent. In addition, our models suggest that Arabians could have derived their ancestry from Natufian-like lo local hunter-gatherer populations instead of Levantine farmers. As we can see, there are essentially two types of people in the Middle East, Natufian Afrasan Semites and Indo-European Iranians. Keep in mind, Indo-Europeans are, or Iranians are Indo-Europeans. The Iranian peoples are a diverse Indo-European ethno-linguistic group identified by their use of the Iranian language and other cultural similarities. Proto-Indo-European is a theorized common ancestor of the Indo-European language family. Its proposed features have been derived by linguistic reconstruction from documented Indo-European languages. No direct record of Proto-Indo-European exists. Proto-Indo-Iranian is a reconstructed proto-language of the Indo-Iranian slash Indo-Iranic branch of Indo-European. Its speakers, the hypothetical Proto-Indo-Iranians, are assumed to have lived in the late 3rd millennium BC. Proto-Indo-Iranian was a, was a Satsuturan language likely removed less than, a, less than a millennium from its ancestor. The late Proto-Indo-European language and in turn removed less than a millennium from the Vedic Sanskrit of the Vidid uh, Vidid its descendants. Proto-Indo-Iranian has been considered to form a subgroup along with Greek, Armenian, and, uh, and Peregrinian on the basis of many striking similarities in the morphological structure. Proto-Iranian is the reconstructed proto-language of Iranian languages branched a branch of Indo-European languages family, and thus the ancestor of the Iranian languages, such as, and I mentioned some of them, like Kurdish and uh, Persian and others like that. The Proto-Iranian was a Satsuturan language descended from the Proto-Indo-Iranian language, which in turn came from the Proto-Indo-European language. And the Indo-Iranian languages, or Aryan languages, constitute the largest and southeastern most extent branch of the Indo-European language family. And then you have the Iranian language, a branch or a branch of Indo-Iranian languages of the Indo-European language family that has that are spoken uh, natively by the Iranian peoples. And there's just a map showing you the various Iran Iranian uh, so, the Proto-Iranians are believed to have emerged as a separate branch of the Indo-Iranians in Central Asia in the mid-2nd millennium BC. The ancient Iranian peoples who emerged after the 1st millennium BC included the Alans, Medes, Parthians, Persians, Sacs, Scythians, and probably Chimerians, among other, Indo among other Iranian speaking peoples peoples of Western Asia, Central Asia, Eastern Europe, and Eastern and the Eastern Steppe. Modern Iranian peoples include the Balach, Kurds, Lors, Persians, and you know various other groups. J2-M172 is the most common haplogroup in Iran at 23%, 
almost exclusively represented by J2A-M410 subclade at 93%. The other major subclades being J2B-M12. Apart from Iranians, J2 is common in Arabs, Mediterranean, and Balkan peoples such as Serbs, Greeks, Albanians, Italians, Macedonians, Bulgarians, Turks, in the Caucasus with the Armenians, Georgians, Chechnyans, English, Northeastern Turkey, North slash Northwestern Iran, Kurds, Persians, whilst its frequency drops suddenly beyond pa Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Northern India. In Europe, J2A is more common in the Southern Greece and Southern Italy, whilst J2 B, which is J2-M12, is common in Thracia, Macedonia, and central northern Italy. Thus, J2A and its subgroup within it have a wide distribution from Italy to India, whilst J2B is most confined, mostly confined to the Balkans in Italy. Now I have a video dealing with capital J. Basically, it is stretched from Greece to India among various Indo-European peoples. So furthermore, we know that Armenians are also Indo-Europeans, but they too are genetically very similar to ancient European populations. This is from genetic um, evidence for an origin of the Armenians from Bronze Age mixing of multiple populations. And it says, the Armenians are a culturally isolated population who historically inhabited a region in the Near East found by the Mediterranean the, and Black Seas in the Caucasus, but remain, un, but remain underrepresented in genetic studies and have a complex history, including a major geographic displacement during World War I. We find that Armenians form a distinctive cluster linking the Near East, Europe, and the Caucasus. We show that Armenian diversity can be explained by several mixtures of Eurasian populations that occurred between 3000 and 2000 BCE, a period characterized by major population migrations after the domestication of the horse, appearance of chariots, and rise of advanced civilizations in the Near East. However, genetic signals of population mixture cease after 1200 BC, when Bronze Age civilizations in the Eastern Mediterranean world suddenly and violently collapsed. Armenians have since remained isolated and genetic structure within the population developed 500 years ago when Armenian when Armenia was divided between the Ottomans and the Safavid Empire in Iran. Finally, here's the key thing to hear. Finally, we show that Armenians have higher genetic affinity to Neolithic Europeans than other present-day Near Easterners, and that 29% of Iranian and of Armenian, excuse me, Armenian ancestry may originate from an ancestral population that would that is best represented by Neolithic Europeans. Insight into the human past comes from diverse areas, including history, archaeology, linguistics, and interestingly, genetics. The observed patterns of present-day genetic diversity can be, com can be compared with models that include past population processes such as migrations, divergence, and a mixture in the best model chosen. These models often require representing ancestral populations and mostly consider present-day populations as direct descendants of the ancient inhabitants of a region. However, Archaeology and genetic data reveal that human history has often been shaped by regional or localized population movements that can co that can confound simple demographic models. Ancient DNA or ADNA studies have showed have also showed shown that the genetic landscape has continuously been shifting, possibly triggered by environmental and cultural transitions. Ancient DNA research is useful for understanding past demographic events. However, samples are limited in obtaining ancient DNA from warm climates remains a challenge. We, sh we have previously shown that, that 
study that studying genetic isolates also provides insight into human genetic variation and past demographic events. For example, by studying Jews, Druids, and Christians from the Near East, we show that the region has more genetic affinity to Europe 2,000 years ago than present. So that's very interesting. So there are Middle Eastern populations that had more genetic affinity to Europe 2,000 years ago. Very interesting. In the present study, we have we investigated the Armenians, a population today confined to the Caucasus, but who occupied eastern Turkey. They have their own language, their own alphabet and language, which is classified as an independent branch of the Indo-European language family. The Armenian language is a subject of interest and debate among linguists for its distinctive uh, biological developments within Indo-European languages and for its affinity to Balkan languages such as Greek and Albanian, which I mentioned in previous videos. The historical homeland of the Armenians site uh, north of the, near, of the Fertile Crescent, a region of subsequent importance to modern human development. Furthermore, Armenia's location may have been important for the spread of Indo-European languages since it is believed to encompass or be close to the Proto-Indo-European homeland Anatolia or Pontic Steep, from which the Indo-Europeans and their cultures spread to Western Europe, Central Asia, and India. Armenians were found to have genetic affinity to several other populations, including the Jews, the Druze, Lebanese Christians, in addition to showing genetic continuity with the Caucasus. So Armenians are related to Middle Eastern populations. And we know that Armenians are Indo-Europeans, so that's very interesting. Let's keep that in mind. So we observe that Armenians form a distinctive cluster bound by Europeans, Near Easterners, and the Caucasus populations. More specifically, Armenians are close to Spaniards, Italians, and Romanians from Europe, number one. The number two, Lebanese, Jews, Druze, and Crichtons from the Near East. Then three, Georgians, Azerbaijanis, and the Caucasus. So these are the populations that, that Armenians are closely related to. Mostly, most of these populations are non-Semitic speakers, the uh, European and Caucasian. That's very interesting. The admixture between the uh, the admixture pattern in Armenians appears similar to patterns we have observed in some other genetic isolates in the region, such as Sephardic Jews and Lebanese Christians, who show limited admixture with culturally different neighboring populations in the last two millennium. Our our test suggests that Armenians had no significant mixture with other populations in the recent history and have thus been genetically isolated since the end of the Bronze Age 3,000 years ago. And this is exactly why Armenians are important because the fact that they haven't mixed with anyone since the Bronze Age, they are a perfect genetic isolated population that we can use to test and see, okay, how is everybody else in the Middle East? Are they connected to this population that was isolated and how was the ancient Middle East because this population is isolated. So further it says, we find in Armenians and other genetic isolates in the, near, in the Near East high shared ancestry with ancient European farmers. So genetic isolates in the Near East, like Armenians, are very high in ancient European farmers. That's interesting. With ancestry portions being similar to present day Europeans, but not to present day Near Easterners. So there is most definitely something going on here. There is some type of difference when it comes to ancient Middle Easterners and modern Middle Easterners. I'm going to read that one more time. We find in Armenians and other genetic isolates in the Near East, high uh, Near East, high shared ancestry with ancient European farmers, with ancestry proportions being similar to present day Europeans, but not to present day Near Easterners. So Armenians are basically a European population, and there are ancient 
or should I say there are genetic other genetic isolates in the Near East that have ancient European related ancestry and they're no different than a present day European, even though they're in the Middle East. So further it says in yellow, this results suggest that genetic isolates in the Near East, Cretans and island population, Near Eastern Jews and Christians, religious isolates, and Armenians, ethno-linguistic isolates, probably retain the features of an ancient genetic landscape in the Near East that had a, that had more affinity to Europe than the present populations do. Very interesting. So there so genetic isolates, certain genetic isolates in the Middle East have far more in common with Europe and European population than to Middle Eastern populations. Basically at some point in ancient history there was uh, European groups in the Middle East and some of these groups are you know lived on and still exist today. So Further, it says, our tests show that most of the Near East genetic isolates ancestry that is shared with Europeans can be attributed to the expansion after the Neolithic period. And uh, obviously this is extremely important to know that there are, that there was one, you know, ancient European populations in the Middle East. And these, some, some of these groups still exist. They still have people who are genetically, genetically basically, European living in the Middle East that are genetically isolated. And further, it says, we uh, here we investigated the information that can be obtained by genetic analysis of present day Armenians and comparisons with other present day and ancient samples. The position of the Armenians within global genetic diversity appears to mirror the, ge the geographical location of Turkey. Uh, which forms a bridge connecting Europe, the Near East, and the Caucasus. It is believed to have been the origin and such or root of migrating Near Eastern farmers towards Europe during the Neolithic, Neolithic and has probably played a major role in the dispersal of Indo-European languages. Armenians adopted uh, Armenians' uh, adoption of a distinctive culture early in their history resulted in their genetic isolation from their neighboring, from their surroundings, their genetic resemblance today to other genetic isolates in the Near East, but not to other Near Easterners, suggests that recent admixture has changed the genetic landscape in most populations in the region. Armenians' genetic diversity reveals that the ancient Near East had higher affinity to Neolithic Europe than it does now. I'll repeat that again. Armenians genetic diversity reveals that the ancient Near East had higher affinity to Neolithic Europe than it does now. And, and that Bronze Age demographic processes have a major impact on the genetics of populations in this region. Isolated populations are emerging as a powerful tool for many different genetic investigations such as rare variant associations with complex phenotypes and the characterization of gene environment interactions. As we can see, there is an ancient Indo-European component in the Middle East populations. And one thing and, and, and one thing is that both Ar Armenians and Iranians have in common is that they are both Indo-Europeans. Furthermore, Proto-Indo-Europeans likely originated either in Armenia or Iran. David Reach, in his 2018 publication, Who Are Who We Are and How We Got Here, says the most likely location of the population that first spoke an Indo-European language was south of the Caucasus Mountains, perhaps in present-day Iran or Armenia, because ancient DNA from people who lived there matches what we would expect for a source population, both for the Yanaya and for ancient Anatolians. And this is from Chen or Chu Chen Shou Wang, excuse me for my mispronunciation of his name. In his 2018 study, The Genetic Prehistory of the Greater Caucasus, and it says, the insight that the Caucasus Mountains serve not only as a corridor for the spread of Caucasus hunter gatherers slash, Iran, slash Neolithic Iranian ancestry, but also for later gene flow from the south, also has a bearing 
on the postulated homelands of Proto-Indo-European languages and documented gene flows that could have carried a consecutive spread of both across West Eurasia, uh, West uh, Eurasia, perceiving the Caucasus as an occasional bridge rather than a strict border during the border during the uh, Neolithic and Bronze Age opens up the possibility of a homeland of Proto-Indo-European south of the Caucasus, which itself provides a parsimonious explanation for an early branching of air of Anatolian languages. Uh, so, furthermore, we know that it was the Caucasus hunter-gatherers slash Iranian-related ancestry that, contri that contributed to the genetic makeup of the Yemnaya or Proto-Indo-Europeans. The Proto-Indo-Europeans, i.e. the Yemnaya people, and the related and the related cultures seem to have been a mixture of Eastern European hunter-gatherers and people related to the Near East, either Caucasus hunter-gatherers or Iranian Caucasian people with a Caucasus hunter-gatherer component. Each of these two populations contributed about half the Yemnaya DNA. According to Jones' at 2015 study, Caucasus hunter-gatherers genomes uh, significantly contributed to the Yemnaya steep herders who migrated into Europe 3000 BCE, supporting a formative Caucasus influence on, on this important early Bronze Age culture. Caucasus hunter-gatherers left their imprints on modern-day populations from the Caucasus and also Central and South Asia, uh, possibly marking the arrival of Indo-Aryan or Indo-Iranian languages. Our analysis show that the ancient populations of the Chalcolithic Iran, Chalcolithic Armenia, Bronze Age Armenia, and Chalcolithic Anatolia were all comprised of the same ancestral components. That's from genetic insights into the origins of farming in the ancient Near East. So basically, Caucasus hunter-gatherer Iranian DNA and Eastern hunter-gatherers came together, creating the Yunaya and the Yunaya of Proto-Indo-Europeans. So, and of course, Proto-Indo-Europeans are likely the descendants of Japheth, and Caucasus hunter-gatherers contributed basically half of their DNA to Proto-Indo-Europeans. This is from um, Merce, uh, Mercer Dictionary of the Bible, and I'm just going to read what's in yellow, and it says, Japheth, may God enlarge, who was one of the sons, one of Noah's sons. Apparently, Japheth was fruitful, for he had at least seven children who became the ancestors of the people who lived in the north and west of Palestine in the modern territory of the of the Anatolia and the Aegean. Thus Japheth primarily became the ancestor of the modern day Indo European family of nations. Most people agree that Japheth is Indo European. It's likely that Caucasus hunter gathers are descendants of Japheth. It's highly likely. Caucasus hunter-gatherers also had half the group J, and half the group J would have been part of the Indo-European migration. Jones, a 2015 study, analyzed genomes from males from West Georgia, Western Georgia and the Caucasus, from the late, up, late Upper Paleolithic and the Mesolithic. These two males carried Y-DNA, half the group J star, and J2A, later refined to j one dash Y6305 and J2-Y12379. The mitochondrial haplogroups of K3 and H13C respectively. The re researchers found that caucus that these caucus hunter-gatherers were probably the source of the Near Eastern DNA in the Yemnaya. This is from how Eurasia was born, and it says, while early Indo-Europeans who originally crossed from Anatolia in the Bronze Age were most likely represented by various J2 subclades, genetic data suggests that as soon as they reached Central Europe, they assimilated large masses of the native population, and from then on, the, the rest of their expansion were characterized by more recently formed subclades of the haplogroups characteristics of the native populations. And so here's just a map showing you uh, the association and distribution of haplogroup J in Indo-European and it fits perfectly. So the spread of Indo-Europeans would have been 
in the similar location for the spread of Japheth as well. If Indo-Europeans came from the southern Caucasus, you know, our, our, the Armenian uh, plateau going into Anatolia, the Pontic Steep in Iran, and Indo-European languages, same way, going into Anatolia, the uh, United culture in Iran. And this is the same route that Japheth descendants would have taken. If you look at any Bible map for the migration of Japheth, it's going into the exact same locations of Europe, Central Asia, and South Asia, Japheth descendants, and the same place where we see the spread of Indo-European languages and this Caucasus hunter-gatherer Iranian DNA. So it makes more sense for haplogroup J to belong to Japheth than Shem. Uh, basically, you know, Caucasus hunter-gatherers literally created the Proto-Indo-Europeans. Haplogroup J and Caucasus hunter-gatherer slash Iranian DNA has more of a connection to Proto-Indo-Europeans in origin than to Proto-Afro-Asiatics and Proto-Semites in origin. Basically, we see two types of people genetically in the Middle East, the Natufian Afrasan Semites and Indo-European Iranians. The genetic, the genomic history of the Middle East. Arabians and Bedouins are positioned close to ancient Levantines, while present-day Levantines are drawn towards Bronze Age Europeans, Iraqi Arabs, Iraqi Kurds, and Assyrians appear, appear relatively closer to ancient Iranians. Ancient Iranians, Indo-Europeans. Uh, genetic evidence for an origin of the Armenians form, uh, from Bronze Age mixing of multiple populations. And it says, we find in Armenian and other genetic isolates in the Near East, higher shared ancestry with ancient European farmers with ancestral proportions being similar to present day Europeans, but not to present day Near Easterners. These Results suggest that genetic isolates in the Near East, Cretans, uh, uh, an island population, Near Eastern Jews and Christians, religious isolates, and Armenians, ethno-linguistic isolates, probably retain the features of an ancient genetic landscape in the Near East that had more affinity to Europe than the present populations do. Our, our tests show that most of the genetic of the Near East genetic isolates ancestry that is shared with Europeans can be attributed to expansion after the Neolithic period. So we did have the middle uh, European populations in the ancient Near East which we covered and some of these people just stayed in the region and they became genetic isolates. So there are Europeans today which is fascinating. And this is very in stark contrast to who Semites would be this paper makes an additional inference since there is archaeological and physical anthropological reason to believe that the Natufians were related to modern Semitic speaking peoples of the Levant. The Natufian sample consists of 61.2% Arabian, 21.2% North African, 10.9% West Asian, and 6.8% Omadi. As I keep stating, two types of people are genetically are genetically in the Middle East. You have your Natufian Afrasan Semites and Indo-European Iranian Caucasus hunter-gatherers. Now the question is, is there any evidence of Indo-Europeans in the ancient Middle East? Besides the fact that, you know, they originated there, you know, Indo-European popping up there. Besides from that, is there any evidence uh, from history of an Indo-European population and kingdoms in the uh, Middle East historically. But this is where we end haplogroup E versus J, proto-Semitic genome. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and don't forget to subscribe, click the bell, share the video. And if you have any questions, just leave a comment, follow all my social medias that I mentioned at the beginning of the video for more information and to contact me. And with all of that out of the way, have a great day and shalom.